So I was reading um, this writer, Nina McLaughlin, and she asks a question, what is the word for sky? And again, how many languages does the rain speak? Is anyone fluent in all of them? Interesting questions. But she was speaking to the problem of, of fully communicating when we can't do it in person. She was pondering this new reality that we have right now. So much is lost across the computer screen and through a phone speaker, right? Yet there's so much we share in experience, just by being human, that when we seek to understand that experience in one another, we can begin to imagine a new kind of language to use. We can forge ahead intentionally, you have to be intentional about it, to find a new way to more fully live, to be community in our present now. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. We know this because Jesus, Jesus was raised up on the cross and died, filled every space of hell was raised up again in perfected form and went on to fill every space in the heavens. Don't you know that there is no place that you can go that God is not there already? Don't you know that even the places you go in your mind, the Spirit of God is already there? Okay, that last point is a little scary, maybe. <laughs> but it is comforting as well. Romans 8, Paul says, when we cry, Abba, Father, Oma, Papi, Madre, Baba, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we belong to God, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. How do we speak of this God who is also a parent? Redemption and friend. Fire and comforter. What language do we use to communicate these things and to live the reality that there is such a God? To live like we believe in a reality that there is such a God. If we have something to, it, or it, it actually, yes, may have something to do with hope, which has everything to do with imagination, which can only happen upon reflection. And we do that together now. And we call each other to do that throughout the week. So here's, here's one way to reflect. So um, McLaughlin continues. Sky. And she's musing on the word sky. Rhymes with high and fly and why. Rhymes with I and by and die. Stay with me. There's a breath in the word. Each one of these three letters makes itself known. And I love how she, she writes about this, it's beautiful. S, hisses with space and air, curves like cloud, like the paths of the wind, the sound of shifting leaves against the streets and sidewalks, which leads us to the, to the tall stalk of the K, like the edge of a cliff falling into the sky. K, every edge that the sky comes up against, Skyscrapers, peaks, the bark on all the trunks, each rock. K, the craters where the sky sinks in. K, the kaleidoscope, the cliff, the cliff and the kaleidoscope, the hard edge, all the colors spinning. And why, I, I, 
like the S and the Y keep coming, it lasts out the mouth, cold and hot at once. Why? I for an all-seeing sky, I that absorbs its light, its sun god, its glowing pearly moon, I that strains to see as far as the eye can see, and also I, I and the sky, I and all. I am your sky. I belong to you. I am you. All from the word sky. When we cry out to God, to a parent that nurtures, takes on all the grief and horror of all that we continue to choose to do, yet allows us to know some of the consequences of that, fills us with power and assurance, the knowledge of that spirit in us, comforts us while convicting us to do something about the grief and horrors in which we are complicit. When I cry out in my own language, my spirit knows. My spirit knows that God's spirit accepts me. Not only does God's spirit accept me, I belong to God. Crater, where the sky sinks in, the spirit sinking into the craters of my soul. And this same spirit testifies to yours, the very same thing, and you belong. And together we belong to this God that cannot be adequately described with words but whom we can experience in our own way, with our own language, and find a way to communicate, to create new language that needs a bit of time to reflect on the word, on the being that is God. So McLaughlin uh, realizes we can't always alter what's on the outside. But we can alter our perspective on it. When before, she, was, uh, she said that she could express something powerful, wordless, with a, a grasp of the hand or a hug. And she, called it, or she described it as the press of your chest against mine. She said, I thought of words as distancers, as approximations. But I had to change my thinking about this. Could not feel the press of your chest against my body. So how could I touch you this way with words? Words as biological. Language from the body. And our faith tradition already intuits this when John begins to speak about Jesus in this way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And, the, and, and Jesus, Jesus was biological. Jesus, language as body, is the language that is communicated by being. And now we are called the body of Christ. What came into being is life, the light, language as life. And so when we speak with each other across the screen, not just at each other, but in sharing the same spirit, the same life force, the same primordial language. We have this power to speak life and light into one another, to notice what we can in this visual, sure, and breathe in the spirit who helps us to see things, see each other in a different way. Wow, your anger is really more about your grief. I get it. To tell the truth about how you feel neglected and that we belong to this God who knows what we want even before we think it with words. To tell the truth about how you feel and that we belong to this God who knows what we want even before we think it with words. Do I dare invite God 
as a psalmist does, to search me, to know my heart, to test and to see if there's anything unloving in it. Do I dare invite God to open my eyes and give me spirit sight to know your heart? A good example of, of somebody who did this, Rabbi Jeffrey Myers of Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue, where 12 worshipers were killed on October 27, 20, uh, 2018. He says that he's eliminated the H word from his vocabulary. Is that I was mulling over what I could say that has not yet been said, Myers recalls. And that's when the divine inspiration came to me. This is all about language. So he recognized that hatred was an obscenity. So he vowed to never say it again. We can't legislate it away. We can't make up a law that says you can't use the word hate anymore. But we have to be consciously willing to say, I am willing to change how I talk. And something fundamental happens when we are intentional about our speech. Removing a word that's thrown around so easily, essential in the vernacular, we use it all the time. I hate strawberry ice cream. I hate it when you chew in your sleep. <laughs> Only people who um, really love old musicals would understand that reference. You chew in your sleep. If you know what it is, uh, put it down on the... If, Mom, if you're watching, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> but type it in. I'm going to see if anybody knows. I hate it when you leave your socks around after cycling all day. <laughs> I hate Zoom. I don't actually, but I know a lot of people who do. It makes us stop for a moment. Consider, what do I really mean if I'm taking this word out? What does this attitude say about me? What am I really communicating to the one to whom I am speaking? We just had communion with the Rockton Church a week ago yesterday, and today is drive-up communion with the Duran Church. And in reflecting on communion and the scriptures and the happenings of our times, the division and strife in our nation, in our churches, in ourselves, between ourselves, maybe it's time Maybe it's a good time for a good cleansing with communion. Cleansing ourselves of our sins as we accept the body and blood of Christ. Cleansing ourselves of our divisions within ourselves, between ourselves. I am moved by the scriptures speaking of the Spirit. For if you, this is from Romans 8, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is the very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But are you living according to the flesh? Are you angry? Are you upset? Are you anxious? Have you lost hope? We so easily justify the acts of the flesh. But there is no justification for sin. There is no justification for sin. Sometimes I think of uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, and it's, it's uh, Jesus speaking to the church, or the word coming to uh, John, about the church uh, in Ephesus. And Revelation 2, 4 says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Or some versions say, you have lost your first love. 
or forsaken your first love? Have you abandoned your first love? Romans 8 uh, and verse 16 is a very important verse for Methodists. Um, it is, the verse says, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I've shared this many times, but Wesley taught that unless the spirit of God has testified to your spirit, you are not saved. Uh, this is called the witness of the spirit. Have you experienced the witness of the spirit? Sometimes I'm in churches and I see people and I just don't seem to see the spirit in them. How can we see the Spirit in them? By the fruit. By the fruit. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, I, I teach that song to people, and I, I, uh, I actually have a little bit of an ulterior motive, I'm going to confess to you. And don't tell anyone... But uh, when there's a, a controversy and people are upset, especially in a church, and someone comes to me in a meeting or privately and complains about something or someone, I can ask them, where is the spirit in this? And once I've uh, tried to get this in people's heads, and I loved it that I, in my youth ministry, that was a song that everyone knew. And I said, what are the fruits of the spirit? And they'd all start singing the song. And I wanted to ingrain it in people's heads. And so the ulterior motive is, I, um, I I keep having this kind of fantasy in my head that someone's going to come to me and be like, oh, I'm so angry at this person. And I can say, yeah, but where's the Spirit? Where are the fruits of the Spirit? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where are those fruits in what you are sharing? And how might... If you desire to get those fruits, how might you get them? I might sound like I'm making light of this, but it is actually very serious because we forsake our first love too easily. We don't live by the Spirit. We too easily go to the flesh. And what are the works of the flesh? Galatians 5 says, Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty heavy. Because as Romans 8.13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It seems to me that I often see people in church who don't have the Spirit. And I sometimes wonder why they are a part of church. I don't want there to come a day when you have to stand before our Lord... And it comes to, and you come to find out that you lived your life by religiosity and not by the Spirit. Will Jesus say, I never knew you? In Matthew chapter 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. It's a scary verse. Do we have the Spirit? We can all have the Spirit. I, I think of the song, We Are One in the Spirit, and that connects, we didn't pick it as a song today, but it connects with the message, We Belong. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness. Do, are we living by those things? Are we passionate about our love for God? And is that seen in us? Is there evidence of it by the fruit? We can all have this spirit. How? You ask the Lord for it. We get on our knees. We seek repentance. 
We take communion and let the body and blood of Christ wash away all unrighteousness. Let us break the divisions and strifes, strife in our hearts between each other. Let us come together. We can belong to Christ and to each other as the body of Christ. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. See if there's anything unloving in it. It's hard to feel like we belong anywhere when we can't meet in our usual ways. But I wonder, I wonder if rethinking what meeting, meeting in other ways can do for someone else's sense of belonging to a community that will do anything to make sure that no one is at risk of contracting the vi novel virus and that you want to be in her company, that you want him to know he belongs. So I will do a thing I said I wouldn't when I used to say an obscenity. So you are safe and you know that you belong. Of course, when I suggested giving uh, the, our sermon the title, We Belong, how he pulled out his guitar and some chords and started singing that uh, Pat, Pat, Pat Benatar song uh, by that name. And I thought, yes, and I said that too. <laughs> what a great song about relationship and belonging to each other, the responsibility of it and reframing the way that we see each other and that relationship. So this will be our offertory and um, I want to hear all of you 80s loving music lovers belting this out all the way to Fremont Street. Uh, but first, listen to some of the words. Many times I tried to tell you. Many times I cried alone. Always, I'm surprised how well you cut my feelings to the bone. Don't want to leave you, really. I've invested too much time to give you up that easy. So true. <laughs> to the doubts that complicate your mind, we belong. We belong to the light. To the light. We belong to the thunder. We belong to the sound of the words we've, we've both fallen under. Whatever we deny or embrace for worse or for better, we belong together. And maybe it's a sign of weakness, just one more part of this. When I don't know what to say, maybe I just wouldn't know what to do with my strength anyway. Have we become a habit? Do we distort the facts? Now there's no looking back. There's no turning back. When you say, when we say, you belong, we belong, together, to the light, to the thunder. So sing, sing with us. And as we go into our offertory, we belong to the Most High, the Divine, and we belong to one another. As we remember the words from Acts chapter 2, of the, on the early church where it is written, all who believed were together and had all things in common. May we come together and worship now in our giving of our tithes and offerings to have all things in common in the giving of our hearts and lives for the kingdom of God. And hear this song. This is a song about relationships. And what is Christianity but relationships? Relationship with Abba, Madre. Relationship with each other.